Okay, open with me in your Bibles to uh, 2 Peter 3, chapter, four, uh, chapter 3, verse 14. And we're going to finish off this study, Defending Your Faith. So as we conclude this, what I'd like to do tonight is, is really just leave you with the exhortation and the warning that the Apostle Peter leaves those he's writing to. At the end of his life, this is what he was concerned about, was false teachers, false doctrine, and how to keep yourself from falling. Now, we have looked at a whole number of subjects in this series. You know, we've looked at what is truth. We've looked at are all religions true and how do you know God exists? How do you know the Bible is the word of God? Creation versus evolution. We've looked at did you, Jesus truly rise again from the dead? Why does God allow suffering, evil in this world? the emergent church, and then last week we looked at the spirituality movement, the New Age spirituality movement. And so there are a whole lot of, well, attacks upon your faith. And so are you ready to defend yourself? Are you ready to deal with these issues? And so hopefully... We have helped you and prepared you to better address these issues that come your way because it's a constant thing. And every time I think, well, I've, uh, I've, you know, we're doing just great here, a new thing comes about. A new issue comes into the church. So what does Peter tell the people to do so they won't fall, so that they won't be deceived? What does he tell them to do? Read with me here, beginning in verse 14. Chapter 3, verse 14. He says, Therefore, beloved, looking forward to these things, be diligent to be found by him in peace without spot and blameless, and account that the long suffering of the Lord is salvation, as also our beloved brother Paul, according to the wisdom given to him, has written to you. As also in all his epistles, speaking in them of these things, in which are some things hard to understand, which those who are untaught and unstable twist to their own destruction, as they do also the rest of the scriptures. You, therefore, beloved, since you know these things beforehand, beware lest you also fall from your own steadfastness, being led away with the error of the wicked. But grow in grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To him be glory, both now and forever. Amen. So here is a very important passage of Scripture. I believe that this particular last few words of the Apostle Peter I mean, is just so important because he gives us here some incredibly important exhortation and warning. Now, just before we were reading here, beginning in verse 14, he is telling them that the Lord is going to come again, that one day he is going to come and dissolve everything in the heavens with a, uh, a just melt every element and it's all going to be dissolved. Verse 12, he said, The heavens will be dissolved, being on fire. And verse 13, he says, His promise to look for a new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. And so then he says to them, Looking forward to these things, referring to the return of the Lord. He says, looking forward to these things, be diligent to be found by him in peace, without spot and blameless, or in holiness, literally. <clears throat> so he encourages the people here to first be looking, be looking in a particular direction constantly. Now, this is in the present tense, this word looking here. 
And it's, it refers here to looking forward constantly to these things. The hope of this new heaven and this new earth. Notice, not looking forward to the tribulation period, looking forward to what's beyond that. So, very important concept. Then he says, you should be diligent. Now, this word diligent is, is in the imperative, which means it's a command. He's, he's commanding us, look, be diligent about your own walk and where your focus is. So where is your focus on a continual basis? Is it looking to the Lord's return? Are you looking to the new heavens, the new earth? Are you looking to the ultimate end of all things? I believe that that is critical. In Luke 12, 45 and 46, Jesus said this to, his, to the disciples. He said, if that servant says in his heart, my master is delaying his coming and begins to beat the male and female servants and to eat and drink and be drunk, the master of that servant will come in a day when, what? He is not looking for him. And at an hour when he is not aware and will cut him in two and appoint him his portion with the unbelievers. Now this is a very clear warning by Jesus. But the issue here, the point that I'm, I'm making here is that this individual that says the Lord is delaying his coming is not looking for him. And that is exactly what Peter tells us to do here. To be looking for him. And so if I'm not really looking for him, then I am moving in that direction to saying he's delaying his coming. And that is what brings our heart into that place of deception. And so I believe it is essential that we focus our attention on where, where are we looking every day? What are we, when we wake up in the morning, what are we looking for? I'm looking for him to come again. You need to keep your focus there. It should be in your prayers. In Titus 2.13, Paul said, looking for the blessed hope and the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior. This is where we need to be looking. And so it's a message in the Apostle Paul's ministry and in Peter's ministry. And so his coming is near. So be looking. I believe that this focus of your attention is really where this whole exhortation begins and is an essential part of protecting you. Then notice he goes on in verse 16 and he tells them to beware of those who are untaught and unstable who twist the scriptures to their own destruction. Now, this is a warning here, I believe, that really fits with our whole series very well. You know, if you look at every cult group, every occult group, every aberrant Christian group, they all twist the scriptures. That's where their problem begins. And this is a key issue that he is saying, look, beware. Be ready, be watching, because these individuals are taking things that sometimes are hard to understand. And I would definitely agree with some of the things that Paul writes are hard to understand. I'm telling you, when I teach through Romans chapter 9, 10, and 11, oh boy, those are difficult passages. And it's, you, you come, there's several of these kinds of passages through the scripture, and you, you look at them and you just go, boy, I, I just, I mean, I'm pounding the books. And I am, I am praying my guts out. Lord, help me to understand these passages because they're hard to understand. But people who are not taught in the scripture or unstable in their own lives Really, that's why they twist these things in God's word for their own purposes. 
Now the word here, twist, is a Greek word that literally means torture. They torture the scriptures. And it comes from the torture racks of the, of the dark ages. And so he's using this terminology that is, is very clear as to what they are doing. They are twisting. They're, a torture rack basically was used by people throughout time to get people to say what they wanted them to say. And so when they torture the scriptures, they twist them out of their context to make them say what they want them to say. And really, literally, you can make the Bible say anything you want if you take a passage out of its context. And so he's warning us here about those who twist the scripture. You know, the Jehovah Witnesses, whenever you talk with them at, at your door, they will always quote the verses of scripture that make it sound like Jesus really is not God come in the flesh. And they take them out of the context of the scripture as a whole that make it very clear that he is God come in the flesh. And so when you just look at one verse of scripture out of its context, you can make it say, and anybody that is untaught in the scriptures, they will believe it because they don't know any better. Every one of the cults is like this. All of the occult groups, the New Age movement, they use the scripture. They use the scripture because they twist it out of its context and they make it say something that God never intended to say. But how do you know if somebody is twisting the scripture to their own destruction? Well, I, you, the only way you know is by knowing the scripture. That's it. You see, you have to be taught. See, notice who is, who is these individuals, these deceivers? Who are they after? They're after people who are also untaught and unstable in their own lives. This word untaught literally means just unlearned or ignorant. Unstable means those that are unfixed or not steadfast. And so they're looking for people like this. And most of the cults today are filled with people who have come from, Bible, from weak teaching churches, Christian churches, because they don't know the scripture. <coughs> Excuse me. And so if they don't know the scriptures then they will stay unstable, unfixed in their own life. A person who knows the scriptures, they are going to become stable and fixed in their life and in their walk with him. And so it's a, it's a, it's a very simple thing. In Acts chapter 17, verse 11, there it says concerning the people in Berea that they were more fair-minded than those in Thessalonica in that they received the word with all readiness and they searched the scriptures daily to find out whether these things were so. And so this is a great example to follow. Search the scriptures on a daily basis. And I, I pray that you are doing that in your own personal life because you need to do this. Now, I always warn people if they're going to twist the scripture that they are in danger of their own destruction. Notice the text there, verse 16. Those who are untaught and unstable twist to their own destruction as they do also the rest of the scriptures. And I believe that that is a warning you need to give to people when they are twisting the word of God, and especially to those that come to your doorstep uh, in the cults because this is a warning they need to hear. It is essential. Now, do you think that it is really possible for you to fall from your own steadfastness? Think about that. I'm talking to you. Do you think it's possible for you 
to fall from your own steadfastness? I believe it is. I believe that's possible for anyone in this room, every single one of us. And it's, I, I want to explain to you how that takes place, but I think it is very possible. In 1 Corinthians 10, 12, Paul said there, let him who thinks he stands take heed lest he fall. So if you think you're standing, you need to take heed to yourselves lest you fall. Here in the text, he says, verse 17, Beloved, since you know these things beforehand, beware lest you also fall from your own steadfastness, being led away with the error of the wicked. Now, notice how he tells us we might possibly fall. It's being led away by the error of the wicked. Now, what is the error of the wicked? Well, in the context of this epistle, it's people who turn the grace of God into a cloak of lasciviousness so that they might do whatever they please. Uh, If you go back to chapter 2 and uh, verse 12, he describes some of these individuals. He says, But these, like natural brute beasts, made to be caught and destroyed, speak evil of those things that they do not understand and will utterly perish in their own corruption and will receive the wages of unrighteousness as those who count it pleasure to carouse in the daytime. They are spots and blemishes carousing in their own deceptions while they feast with you. So they were in the midst of the church feasting with these people. And notice he says, carousing in their own deceptions. He says, having eyes full of adultery that cannot cease from sin, beguiling unstable souls, they have a heart trained to covetous practices and are accursed children. And so, I mean, he is laying into these individuals and he's calling it like it is. Now, if you said that to someone today, they go, oh, you're so harsh. But this is reality. This is what people do. And this goes on in the church today. It goes on in the church today. And so, how does it take place? Well, it all begins with an individual. And I don't care who you are, you can be caught away. Let me give you an example of somebody that you'd probably never think would be caught up in something. How about an apostle? His name is Barnabas. Peter. Remember in Galatians chapter 2, verse 12 and 13? There Paul talks about how Peter and and especially Barnabas, it says, and the rest of the Jews also played the hypocrite with him so that even Barnabas was carried away with their hypocrisy. Carried away. Led away. Very interesting terminology. He is warning the Galatian church, you know, what Peter did and what Barnabas did and what the other Jews did in not having anything to do with Gentiles when the Jews were around, he said it was hypocrisy. It was not love. It was not walking in the truth. So, you know, if these guys could get caught, then I think anybody can get caught. So what is the error of the wicked? Well, it's taking God's word, twisting it out of context using it for your own purposes. Some declare that God doesn't exist or that they aren't a sinner or, you know, they declare there's no judgment to come. This is what many of the cults do today. And they say, oh, you know, there's, there's really no hell. You just go to sleep. You just go into soul sleep. And so there's no judgment. And so you, you hear these, these concepts taught and perpetrated upon people within weak Bible teaching churches and they believe it. They basically, I think one of the most fundamental 
causes that bring a person to fall into error is that a person thinks, you know, the Lord's not going to do anything. He's just not going to do anything. He's not going to deal with me. He's not going to... There's, you see, the non-Christian says there's no judgment. The believer that gets caught says, well, he's not going to do anything to me. I can get away with this. And so when a person thinks they can get away with it, they're basically saying what men have always said. Here is what in Ezekiel chapter 8, verse 12, is what Ezekiel declared the people were saying. God said to Ezekiel, he said, Then he said to me, the son of man, have you seen what the elders of the house of Israel do in the dark? Every man in his room of his idols. For they say, the Lord does not see us. The Lord has forsaken the land. I like that little phrase there. The Lord doesn't see. He's not going to do anything. He doesn't see what I'm doing. I'm just going to do this no matter what. That is the error of the wicked. That's part of the error of the wicked. But it is a fundamental aspect, thinking he's not going to do anything. He's not going to chasten me or correct me. Now, deception always starts with some deceiver, an individual. And they begin to share that stuff with you, you think to yourself, well, yeah, hey, that's okay, that's not bad, that's, I can do that. And they share with you scripture that is taken out of context, and if you are untaught in the scriptures, then you will believe that. And then there is the deceit in your own mind. Deceit in our own minds. We can deceive ourselves into anything. You can rationalize anything. I'm telling you, I have counseled people over the years that have deceived themselves and rationalized every sin that you can imagine. They have rationalized their adultery. They have rationalized their child abuse. They've rationalized their abuse of their spouse. They've rationalized stealing from work. Uh, They've rationalized, you know, embezzling money. And, I mean, every possible thing you can imagine. I have seen professing believers rationalize. And so I know it is very possible. And it's because of our propensity to deceive ourselves. It says in 1 John 1, 8, John says, if we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. Notice that John included himself in that passage. If we say. Now, why did he say this? Because there were some who were saying at that time that he was writing to that they did not have any sin. And he said, basically, they're deceiving themselves. Galatians 6.3, Paul said, if Anyone thinks himself to be something when he is nothing, he deceives himself. And so we are warned over and over again that we can deceive ourselves. But on top of that, we have somebody who wants to deceive us as well. And he uses people to do that in our lives. In 2 Corinthians 11.3, Paul said, I fear lest somehow as the serpent deceived Eve by his craftiness, so your minds may be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. You know, tonight we were singing the simplicity of Christ in our worship. Do you know that? Just loving him, seeking him, knowing him. I mean, that is the simplicity of what the Christian life is all about. You know, it's not, it's not going to church. It's having fellowship with a living God. It's not doing Christian things. It's having a real relationship. And life is exchanged between us. And that's what it's all about. And if I don't have that, I don't have anything. I've just got a bunch. I'm just doing my religious thing. 
But if your mind can be corrupted, he will do it. So your mind is a very important thing. And this is where the Word of God comes in. Now, I would encourage you to guard yourself in this way. Let me just end tonight with this. Let me just give you several encouragements that I think are essential. The first thing is you have to be brutally honest with yourself in your own mind. You cannot deceive yourself. <clears throat> that is where it begins. And so you have, you have to really cultivate an honesty in your own heart between you and the Lord. And that is when you are doing great, when you are doing good, when everything is, you know, or you have some great success. You are used by the Lord to do something just incredible. Honesty in your heart at that moment to go back and acknowledge the Lord and acknowledge that it's His power and it's His grace, it's His Word, it's His Holy Spirit, it's His enablement in your life. That honesty is, is just essential. Now, secondly, you know, that honesty is in the midst of your failure acknowledging what you've done, how you've failed, what, where you have stepped over the line. That is an essential thing. And it's, it's something that many times it just, it just chokes right here in people's throats. They don't want to say it. Well, this is what I did wrong. Please forgive me. It chokes in their, in their, their throat. They just won't give it up. And so... You, do you hear yourself confessing your own sin and acknowledging it? I, I hope that you do because that's honesty. And you need to be honest with the Lord, honest with yourself. And so you need to be brutally honest. Psalm 51, 6, David said, Lord, you desire truth in the inward parts. The inward parts. And that's exactly what David didn't have, and that's what led him into his error. You see, that's why honesty is where it must begin. If I'm going to keep myself steadfast, I have to be brutally honest with myself. So, where you stumble, are you brutally honest about that with yourself? And do you keep that balance of God's grace in the acknowledgement of your sin? Very important. We're going to look at that in just a moment. I think the second thing you need to do is you need to be personally, earnestly contending for the faith. In Jude one three, it says there, Beloved, while I was very diligent to write to you concerning our common salvation, I found it necessary to write to you exhorting you to contend earnestly for the faith which was once and for all delivered to the saints. Do you know what the words contend earnestly mean? They mean to fight, to be a combatant, to fight as in a war. That's what it means. And that's what you're in. You're in a war. And if you aren't fighting, you're losing. This is in the present tense as well. He says you need to be continuously earnestly contending, fighting for the truth of the faith, of the gospel. That's why I title this series of studies Defending Your Faith, because it's a fight, it's a battle, and you have to be a defender of the faith. And it takes place with the people you work with, it takes place in your family, with the people you live with, it takes place in your, with your friends. It takes place everywhere you go. Will you stand up and fight for the truth of the gospel? Where it is corrupted, where there are lies, where there is deception, will you say something? Because that is what is necessary. I'm not saying be weird. I'm not saying be... Uh, you know, 
you know, causing conflict wherever you go, you, but you have to speak the truth in love. And that is what it means. You have to fight for yourself and you have to fight for the souls of others. That's what Peter is doing here. He's fighting for the souls of others by writing this letter because he sees that people have unstable souls have been beguiled. People who are untaught and unstable are being deceived. And he's speaking the truth. And that's what you need to do. You need to do it verbally or you need to do it via email or letter or however you have opportunity to do it. But you need to do it. You need to speak up. Thirdly, I think you need to just grow in your knowledge of God's Word. The word here, grow, in verse 18, but grow in the grace and the knowledge of our Lord, is a Greek word that literally means increase. To grow is to increase. So he's saying here, increase in the grace and the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Now I believe that one of the simplest ways to combat error is to know the truth. It's that simple. But you have to increase in your knowledge of the truth if you will be, are going to be ready for the error that comes your way. And so you have to increase. You have to grow there. Growth is your best defense against error. Because the word convicts you every time you open it up, doesn't it? I tell you, if it doesn't convict you anymore, there's something wrong. I get convicted every single day. I'm praying, saying, God, change this in my heart. Change this in my thinking. Lord, keep me from this error. Don't ever let me think I'm something when I'm nothing. Because I am a sinner saved by the grace of God and I need, I need his truth and his grace. And I like this combination, but he, I, I want to begin with that knowledge because the knowledge of him is what really reveals his grace. As you study his word, always consider the context. I mean, in our text here tonight, that's why I took you back to the passages previous because that is essential for understanding what he means by look, looking forward to these things. Well, what things? You have to always consider the context. Now, the devil knows the Word of God and he will use the Word of God against you if you do not know the context. Probably the best example of that is when Jesus was tempted by the devil. In Matthew's Gospel, chapter 4, verses 5 through 7, it says the devil took him up into the holy city, set him on the pinnacle of the temple, said to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written. So here's the devil using the Scripture. He shall give his angels charge over you, and in their hands they shall bear you up, lest you dash your foot against a stone. Now, isn't that a true saying? Yeah, that is a true saying. That's the truth of God's word, except it's out of context. That's the only problem. Yes, the Lord will give his angels charge over you, and in their hands they'll bear you up, lest you dash your foot against a stone. He's going to protect you. He's going to guide you. He's going to be with you. And he's going to protect you from evil. But does that mean I can just throw all caution to the wind and just throw myself off a building and expect the angels of God to carry me up and protect me? No, that's crazy. And Jesus knew that. And he said, he quoted, Jesus said, It is written again, You shall not tempt the Lord your God. And tempting God is to test him, is to put him to the test, and to throw yourself off a building is to tempt the Lord. And so he gives you a brain, he wants you to use it. And so when people say, oh, I can do this, I I just trust in God. 
I just go, well, don't tempt the Lord. Because you can, you can tell it's the same attitude, the same understanding. And so warn them, don't tempt the Lord. Don't put yourself in a situation that is ungodly or unsafe. Just don't do that. That's not, that's not wise. Jesus dealt with the master deceiver over context. And so will you look at context? Don't take verses out of their, their context. And then fifth, you need to pray for discernment in what you hear and what you read. And whatever book you're reading, whatever Bible study you're listening to, or whatever podcast you're subscribed to, you need to pray for wisdom. You need to pray for discernment. I believe that discernment is one of the great things that is lacking in the body of Christ today. And you know why? Because I think that the church is moving away from expositional teaching. That's why. And when people are not taught, that is why they don't have discernment. It is directly connected with the Word of God and the truth of the Word. And so discernment. I mean, does a red flag go up when you hear something? You go, I don't know about that. That sounds a little off to me. Ah, that person quoted that verse. Is that really, is that what that says? Will you go look it up? I did that just today. I heard something and I, I went, is that right? Went and looked it up. You know, very important principle. Always check out what you hear. Check out what you read. Yeah, there's a verse of scripture there, but did they quote it in context? You go read it in its context and be sure. If the Lord gives you that discernment, take action. Remember Solomon prayed for discernment. In 1 Kings 3.9, he says, Give your servant an understanding heart to judge your people, that I may discern between good and evil. That is an essential thing. Not only between good and evil, but between good and better. That's discernment as well. Not just good and evil. In Philippians 1.9, Paul said, I pray that your love may abound still more and more in knowledge and all discernment. Notice how he connects all knowledge and all discernment together. Because knowledge is what gives you the discernment. That's why we need to be studying the Word on a regular basis. Number six, last here, you need to grow in grace. Increase in grace. Now, how do you increase in grace? Well, first you have to know the grace of God. That's the only way you can increase in, in God's grace is you have to be knowledgeable of His grace. At the beginning of this particular epistle, in Second Peter 1, 2, he says, Grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. So grace and peace is multiplied to you or you increase in that grace and peace. It says in the knowledge of God. The second thing you need is you need to receive grace. You need to receive grace by rejecting your own self-effort to change yourself to, you know, pull yourself up by your bootstraps, to, you know, force yourself to do something. That is not the way you grow in grace. That's growing in self-effort. If you want to grow in grace, you have to reject self-effort. You have to acknowledge, Lord, I cannot change this in me. I can't change my thinking. I can't change my heart attitudes here. Lord, you have got to change me inside. And I believe by your grace you will do that because I believe you to do it right now. When you, when you come to the Lord with that kind of confidence, he's going to change you. 
He's going to change you. I can't tell you how many times I've been angry and just said, Lord, I mean, my heart, I'm, I'm just angry. I'm just upset. Rule over me by your grace. Make this to die inside of me by the power of your Holy Spirit. That's grace. And I'm telling you, it's glorious to sense your heart just begin to change right as you sit there. It's a, it's a glorious thing. But that's the grace of God. That's what makes you grow in grace because then, thirdly, you depend upon His grace. Once you receive it, you start depending upon His grace. Lord, I'm, I'm, I'm going to begin to share with this person and I'm just going to depend on your grace to give me words to speak. And that's what happens. And the more you do that, the more you grow in grace, trusting his grace. In Romans 5.17, Paul there said, For if by one man's offense death reigned through one, much more those who receive abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness will reign in life through the one, Jesus Christ. We're going to reign in life by our own power. No, reign in life by one, Jesus Christ. And so, but it's by receiving abundance of grace and this gift of righteousness. I'm not trying to produce righteousness in my life. I'm receiving the gift of righteousness. And that's by receiving abundance of of grace. And so are you receiving abundance of grace and trusting in his grace? Next, another I think clear way to to really grow in your gra- in grace is to hold fast to the head, submitting yourselves to him. Colossians 2:19. There Paul told the believers what they were doing wrong. He says, you're not holding fast to the head from whom all the body nourished and knit together by joints and ligaments grows with the increase that is from God. So if, they're gonna, if you're going to grow with the increase that is from God, you have to hold fast to the head. Now this word here, hold, holding fast, it literally means to hold on to or to cling to the head. You're clinging to Jesus. Not clinging to your Bible, not clinging to church, not clinging to some other person to help you, not clinging to some belief system. You're clinging to the head, to Jesus. Again, that is the simplicity of the gospel. It's the one-on-one with him. So, are you why is that so important to grow in grace? Because it's the place of surrender. You're clinging to him. You're saying, I can't do this without you. You are the only way I am going to succeed. It's the place of surrender. And then fifth and last, never use his grace as an excuse to go on sinning. You cannot grow in grace if you use his grace as an excuse to sin. It, it just won't happen. And yet that is the, one of the errors of the wicked. And though that which causes someone to fall from their own steadfastness, they presume on the grace of God. And that will bring anybody down because God will not play that game with you. He will correct you And he will stop you because he loves you enough to do that. And so he will reprove you. So in this particular text, in, uh, excuse me, before I go on here, in in Jude 1.4, he says, Certain men have crept in unnoticed who long ago were marked out for this condemnation, ungodly men who turn the grace of our God into lewdness and deny the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. People who turn the grace of God into lewdness, 
into continuance in sin. I'm telling you, this is not a way to grow in grace. So the point of this, of my whole study tonight, is just grow. That is your, your best defense against any of the stuff that comes your way. It's that simple. All of the things that I just explained to you are how you will grow in that grace and in that knowledge of Christ and how you will continue to increase and abound in Him. These are the, these are the key elements that will help you continue to move forward. And you will be an instrument in His hand to fight the good fight, to contend for the faith. And you will, well, the scripture says those who turn many to righteousness will shine as the stars of heaven forever and ever. So if you're going to turn many to righteousness, you're going to have to defend your faith. You're going to have to contend for the faith because one is not going to happen without the other. Don't you want to stand in heaven one day and somebody's going to come up to you and say, you know what? You, you turned me around. Thank you for sharing with me. You, you encouraged me. You, you stepped up to the plate. You rebuked me. You reproved me. You spoke the truth to me. Thank you. I'm telling you, what, a, what an eternity that's going to be. Amen? Amen? Let's go to him in prayer. Father, we thank you that, Lord, there, that day is coming. Lord, for some of us, it's coming quick. For others, it, it is still a way off. But Lord, we pray that you would help us to lift up our eyes and to look for the appearing of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Lord, help us to be diligent, to be found in you. Lord, in holiness. Lord, not ever led away by the error of the wicked. And Lord, I pray that you would help us to, to find those untaught and unstable souls that, that are caught. Lord, help us to speak your word, to earnestly contend for the faith until the day we die. Lord, help us to fight, to get in the battle, and to be overcomers, Lord. Lord, we believe you to do that. In Jesus' name, amen.